so this would be an intro talk. We're going to scratch the surface a bit, and I'll give you some resources if you will, um, you'll be curious to find out more about what are we going to talk about. The title is "Taking Angular Offline," and we'll see how we can we can do that. For those of you not that many from what I see that don't know me, I'm Adrian. I work at Visma. You can find me on Medium or Twitter or Stack Overflow or GitHub or wherever you want. Not on Facebook, though I'm not there anymore. Uh, that's the image that I use everywhere, so if you search for me and I look like that, it's me. You can look for it. Um, yes, the title was a bit of a clickbait, taking Angular offline. It's just a fancy thing. It sounds fancy, that's what I've been taught by other, by other friends that are doing presentations at conferences, that you need to have a clickbait title. So, taking Angular offline. What are we really going to talk about is progressive web apps. Um, how many of you have heard or created progressive web apps? Show of hands. Okay, quite a lot. I know you did because you've created a website. I'll talk about that. Um, I hope I won't bore you to that, or at least not completely. What are progressive web apps? So, according to Mozilla Developer Network, there are apps that work everywhere and provide a user experience that's similar to a native app. So, they look and they feel like native apps, and for what the users are concerned, they uh, behave the same. There shouldn't be not that many, many differences between a progressive web app and a native app. So what does this uh, actually mean? It means that we can have a shortcut on the home screen. So we have a website that's an application, in our case to be an Angular application, and we'll be able to add a shortcut to our application on the host, like any, any other native app. We'll, we'll be able to have push notifications, like the native type. You don't need uh, anything else for your, for your web app. And it feels completely more like a native app, including desktop support. So in uh, Windows, for example, you can add the shortcut to the desktop, and you can find these native apps in the App Store. And they are just a, a browser app. And what I mean by feel like a native app, they have um, a splash screen, they have a color skin, they have the icon, of course, and when you look in uh, Android or iOS at the um, task runner where you see all the applications running, you'll see all your application stand alone beside all the other applications. It won't be just a tab in your browser. So that's, that's what means that to have a more like a native app feel. They are safe. As long as you use HTTPS, uh, we'll see later why you always will use HTTPS. And of course, you can check that the app is truly what you want it to be by looking at the URL. So if you're on mobile.twitter.com, you know that you are on Twitter's progressive web app. And why this is important? Because uh, at least on Android, on iOS, it's not the problem that much. But on Android, you have at least monthly some news that another spyware or adware was added to the market and people got infected by using it. So there are a lot of apps on the Google Play Store that look like something and there are something totally different, let's say. Uh, they are linkable, means you can send someone a link and they click on it and that's it, they're in your app. It's as, uh, as easy as that. And they are network independent, which means that they work in poor network conditions or even offline. We'll, we'll see later how, how that works and why we might want to do it. So very short, this was what a progressive web app is. It's like your normal web application that most of you work on or have a project that's a web application. You just add some features to it and it becomes a progressive web app. Okay, those, that's what a progressive web app is, but why? why we should care about that, why we should invest time and resources in something else that might be just a fancy thing. Well, users spend most of their time on mobile in native apps. And most apps that are native do not need any of the native capabilities. They don't use anything from the phone hardware that they uh, must have that, that you cannot use in a browser. And this is at least very important for me. You can have new releases whenever you want. I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, recent studies show that an average user, an average Android user in this case, installs zero new apps each month because they have, they already have them pre-installed on their phone. So when they install a new app, maybe once each month, but the average, if it's rounded, it's zero. So it's it's very very low. 
And even if they have apps installed, most of the users use between three and five apps more. Like you have your email, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, top five on average that you can use at least daily or several times per week. And they see a native app as a big investment. You install an app, a native app, only if you really need it. It's not something like, okay, I can just use it now and then forget about it. Meanwhile, in average, a user visits about 100 websites each month. So you can look at this difference. Zero new apps each month, 100 pages, 100 web pages each month. It's quite a big difference. So if some of those pages are progressive web apps and the user can add a shortcut to your home screen, you already converted it. It's a big win for your, for your products. There are some people that are very progressive web apps fans and that say that in the future, Progressive web apps will totally replace native apps. I don't buy that 100%, but at least some of them, that's, that's the, the direction in which we are going. And since we can have new releases whenever we want, it's like you can truly have continuous delivery whenever you fix something, you deploy it, and that's it. Your user will get, will get the, new, the new version. You can uh, easily change the way you do A-B testing without uh, any fancy tools and, and so on. There's no app store, no restrictions or no publishing. I'm not sure how many of you ever published an application on uh, iOS, for example. It's not that trivial to do it and not that easy. It takes a bit of time and resources. If you have a progressive web app, you just have it there. You tell your users, go to this URL and you have my application. You skip all that and you can put that there almost anything you want. There are no restrictions. From what I know, Apple and recently Android are very restrictive, or somehow Apple is very restrictive, Android not that much to what type of apps you can put in their store. It has a streamlined install process. Think about what you have to do when you install a native app. You have to look for your, on your phone for the market. You have to open that app. You have to search for the app that you want to install. Uh, you have to click download. In Romania, it's not the case, but in other places, you have to wait for it to be downloaded. We have very fast internet, so that's not a problem. But for some people, this is a problem if, because nowadays most, or at least some native apps are truly staggering when you look at the size, like 200 megabytes application and for free screens and nothing very relevant. And after it's installed, you have to look carefully at all the permissions that you will give to that app if you care for what it can do. And then you can finally open the app. While a progressive web app, you go to the website, you get, you're get already in the app, you get a pop-up, like do you want to add this to your home screen, you click yes and that's it. You have a new, a new application installed. And there are still a lot of people that don't have the high-end phones. Uh, if you've seen recently Samsung released their new phones and they are like 2000 euros one. So there aren't that many people buying this kind of flagship phones. Space still is a problem for most users, or at least for an average user. They have a phone with, I don't know, 8 gigabytes of space, and from time to time they don't want to, to keep on installing apps because they don't have that much, that much free space. But if, uh, if we use a progressive web app, they are quite small, at least most of them. It's like under 10 megabytes of, of data. So there's no space, we don't have any problem with that. We've seen why, and we've seen what they mean, but is anyone actually using progressive web apps as we speak today? Are any big brands that invested in this, in this thing? And the answer is obviously yes. From Twitter to Tinder, Pinterest, Forbes, Uber, Lyft also, but I didn't put the logo here, Trivago, Flipboard, all of them have native apps, especially the one that Twitter made is very good. I know uh, a lot of people that use the progressive web app on their phones instead of the native one because it's lighter, it moves a lot faster and it's simply easier to, to use for that. So if you want to check it out, just go on your phone to mobile.twitter.com and you will get the progressive web app and you will get the pop-up with uh, uh, the option to add a shortcut to your home screen and so on. Yes? RevoJS is also. Yes, I was <laughs> going to say that. Right now. <laughs> Sorry. For this presentation, I've asked Luchan about uh, the conference, if it's public and if can, I can say something about the website and he wasn't sure if I should do that. But now since you uh, presented it, yes, you can just go to the conference website, whatever, just, and you will get um, 
the notification to add it to your home screen and it will look and work like a native app and that would be just nice. Probably some of you will do that now, so I'll use you, but uh, <laughs> let's go on. So these are well-known big brands that are, are already using, uh, using progressive web apps. So it's, this is not, a, not an issue. We can um, start thinking about them quite seriously now. It's not something that will go away in the, in the near future. Okay, I, I said something about offline at some point, that they work offline or in poor network conditions. So what this means, it means they use service workers. And service workers are, let's say something relatively new, not that new, but they gained a lot of uh, traction last year. It's basically a totally separate script from your, from your web application that runs in the background. And it has no UI, no user interaction, it has nothing, and nothing like that. A big restriction in using service worker is that your application must be served over HTTPS. That's what I said you want to have any problems with security. But I'm not sure if anyone has, still has any issues with that. Is anyone working on an application that's not served for HTTPS? It's not a shame or anything, it's just wondering <laughs> if, if there still are. Okay, so see, there's no problem. You can use, use service workers. So a service worker doesn't have any access to the DOM and it has to use the post message interface to communicate with the main application, exactly how we did it for iframes or how we do it. Probably most of you already use this or some of you use this. We have it right now in an application that's in production, so we still use it or have to use it in some kind. They provide the support for push notifications because it's a background script that runs there all the time and you can manage this kind of push notifications. If you will have only your web application, it would have no way of using push notification because it's just closed or you switch to something else and then that's it. And most importantly, it acts like a proxy. So it sits between your, your application and the web. This is somehow how it looks. You have your application, you have the network or the cache and you have the service worker in the middle. So once we add the service worker to our application, all the requests go through this one. Irrelevant if you request a file or if you call an API, all the requests go through our service worker. And it's like an interceptor for all our service requests in our application. And because last days I was too lazy to draw this myself, I kind of borrow it from sessions track blog, so that's why we have the source there. Okay, this is all nice, but you might think that you cannot use them because, of course, this is the web, so we don't have support everywhere and we have to use all kinds of weird things to, to have service workers and progressive web apps. But this is no longer true. Last year was an awesome year for, for this kind of thing. Uh, even um, Safari and iOS added support for this. So they are probably everywhere beside Internet Explorer. I'm sorry, if you still have to support Internet Explorer, then... That's a bummer. This will not work on Internet Explorer. But there are on Firefox, on Edge, on Chrome, like I said, on Safari, and even on the on the mobile ones where it actually matters or matters the most. It, it's even on Samsung Internet, like the browser for the really old or medium to low devices. There's no not exactly an excuse to not use them. This is the screenshot taken from Can I Use. There's also a very nice website. Is service worker ready made by Jake Archibald, so you can check that out and you'll get tons of information of what you can use and what you cannot use related to service worker. Okay, this was a general thing about um, progressive web apps and service workers. And now how to use them in Angular. Of course, you can use them in any kind of web application you want. There's our open web standards, just go to Mozilla documentation or to Chrome developers, check them out and enable them for your application. Probably Andre can tell you later how to do that for the Revo.js website. In Angular, they created the streamlined implementation for this. So it'd be as uh, less hassle as possible for someone to add it to an existing Angular application. And uh, we'll see how to do that. Of course, since it's a streamlined, it's a pre-built thing, it's not that um, flexible or extensible. They gave us something out of the box and that's it, pretty much. If you want to use it, you'll use it. If not, you'll have to roll out your, uh, your own. And there are, of course, uh, other libraries that can help you with uh, 
implementing service workers and progressive web apps. How to add it in Angular? If you have an Angular project, this is the only thing that I have to do. ng add that Angular slash pwa. ng is the Angular CLI for those of you that are not familiar with it. And add is a command that runs a schematic. Schematics are some kind of code mods. They generate code and they change files in your project to add something new. And all the cool and new libraries that are used in Angular are added like this. So you can add testing with just by running ng add just or ng add Cypress to add support for Cypress or something like that. <coughs> this will do quite a lot of things. We'll see in a few seconds what. You can also generate, of course, components or anything else. Most of that work with Angular know that already. I suggest you try adding libraries like this, but don't depend on it. At least do this and then have a look at what it actually did. Because it's a tool that generates and updates code, but you're the one that maintains everything. So at some point, something will get fucked up and you'll have to just sort of fix it. And if you don't know what it did, it will be quite interesting to fix the problem. And I didn't get that used to, to this kind of working with libraries or generating components, but now I'm more into it. But for example, I've created like over 200 components by hand, like new file, and writing everything and now I start generating them with the tool when I'm completely confident I know what I'm actually doing. Also, yep. I don't know what you're doing with kind of this kind of chat, dash dash dry dash run and you can just like, it's gonna do a dry run, it's gonna show all the files that you could, could have created or modified but not do any of the changes. So if you just want to like try shit out without yep. breaking your app, just dash dash dry run and you just Watch it do stuff. And it then will you can see what it updates, right? Then, then you can see what it would have updated. Yeah. yeah. Then yeah. it's a lot. Uh, it, it gives you a lot more confidence. Just like then, just go uh, go on and just try stuff. And Usually, what I do is generate a new blank Angular project, and then run the command there because I want to want to see what they change in the file, not only what they would update. Yeah. Well, that's for, like, for this, yeah. But if you generate components or if you're not sure yeah, about that, typos with paths and stuff like that. And, that's, that's a very good, good point, thanks. Um, so what it actually does? It adds, that's all that that command does in a short way to put it. It adds the Angular service worker package to your package JSON and installs it actually, so you can use it. It registers uh, the service worker in your app module. It enables service worker build support in Angular project, mm -hmm. have an Angular JSON file with the configuration of your project. It has to enable things there. It generates the app manifest file, which is, this is the web manifest that all the progressive web apps use. We'll look at it in a, in a second. It updates the index HTML to reference this manifest file. It installs some icon files, and it creates an ngsw-config.json file, which is the configuration for the service work. We'll have a look at it and what it means. And then, that's it. You're ready for production. If you have an Angular app and you did that, everything is enabled and it works. If you just build the application with that dash dash prod, you can deploy it and you'll have a service worker on your app. I don't think you want to do that though, because for example, the icons that it generates here are Angular icons. You'll get that A with everything. I don't think you want to install your application with Angular icon. But once you had you did that, this is ready to go. When you want to test this out. Usually you serve Angular project with ng-serve, but in this case it doesn't work and I'm somehow sure you don't want it to work because otherwise you cache everything and developing it will be a bit of a pain. You'll need a different um, static file server to serve whatever you build with this. A good option is http-server package. I usually install it, add it to my dev dependencies and create a command that just spins up the server and, and start serving all the files. You have to, or you should use incognito mode, or at least a browser that you don't always use, or not that often, because I had issues with this when I had errors and my service worker went into an inconsistent state and I got old files, I had no idea what's happening, so some of those problems went away using incognito mode. And you can go to your dev tools in your preferred browser and you can change the speed of the network to simulate issues or disable network completely to see that, that the cache works. 
what's actually caching by default. So you've just added it, what happens to your Angular files? Of course, all the um, important ones will be cached, like index and the favicon. All the build artifacts, all the JS files, all the CSS files will be cached by default by your service worker. Everything that you put in your assets folder will be cached and everything that's in root, like all the fonts or images that you have in root will be cached. What this means is that until you deploy a new version, all the requests from your browser will go to the service worker and to the cache to fetch these files. What happens when we deploy a new version of our application? This might be a bit weird and counterintuitive, at least it was for me, but how it works, so like when you start your application or refresh the page, the service worker will check with the server to see if it's a new version deployed. And if it's a new version, it will prefetch or download the files in the background. But it will not wait for that to finish. So your application will not wait for the browser to finish downloading all the files. Even though it knows you have a new version, it will still show you the old version. And at some point you can get a notification that new version is available. And if the user refresh, refreshes or reloads the application, you will get the new version without the need to wait for the down. This this was a bit uh, a bit tricky. This notification is something out of the box, or you have to code some stuff for it to happen. Uh, you have to code some very small thing for it to happen. It's gonna be on the so next it's slide. An event, but you can also just reload the page. Yeah, yeah. You, event if you, you refresh the page afterwards, that's it. You have the new version. If you want to show the user a nice pop-up that okay, a new version is available, click here to refresh or reload the application, then you need to listen for that for that event. That's not the case of the refresh. You wait until it downloads all the things and then you refresh the page and the user is like, oh, something happened. But yeah, then you get a yeah. flicker. Yeah. You're a developer, you look in the dev tool, see if the, all the network requests are done, but for a normal user, it would be nicer to show him a, yeah. a pop-up that something happened. How it checks is for new version. On the server, it generates a file, I think it's called then gsw.json with the hash of your application, or at least with its files. And each time you create a new build, that hash changes. So it just fetches that file from the server and see if the hash is different. If it's different, it tells you that there's a new version available. Will it just hold up like bundles? Or did, I mean, if it just change some CSS, it just No, it has hashes of or all the contents that you have in your build. So, so if I just change some CSS, it's it not will generate like a different hash. hash. It's just going to fetch the CSS file. Uh, no, it depends. It, it depends how you define your assets groups, what it wants to to cache, True. because it can be in a different group. I will look at that in, in a second. So that was what we have to do to add it for, for Angular. And we'll see what we get out of the box, like the notification, the event that you guys mentioned. We get the service worker module and everything, everything is a module, like ng module, at least for now. In the future, it might not be. They're working on a new rendering engine and they will make these modules optional. So we get this module. This one is registered in your app module. And inside this one, we have two services that we can use and only those two. And the first one is service worker update. This is what you're asking for. And you have, of course, an observable because this is Angular, so we have RxJS all over the place that tells you when a new update is available or when a new version of your application is, is available. You can force check for a new version. So by default, like I said, it checks for new versions only when your app is loaded, when the page is refreshed. But if you want to check for new versions, I don't know, each half an hour, you have a method in this service that helps you do that. And you can check if the service worker is enabled or not by using the Boolean property on this service. It's a service you add it in the constructor and get it with depends the injection line, any other service in Angular and use it wherever you want in your application. This is all that this uh, service worker update does. And we have, of course, service worker push, which is for push notifications. And it has a method to subscribe to these push notifications. And observable, of course, that listens for any incoming push notifications in case you want to do something. And the same Boolean method that tells you if the service worker is enabled or not. I don't have any code samples for this because they are in the Angular documentation and it's just a subscribe on a stream, so it's nothing to show here. You import a service and you get a subscribe method on the observable and do whatever you want there. OK, 
okay, both configuration. We have that manifest file, and this is something typical to all progressive web apps. So no matter you use it in Angular or in anything else, you'll have something that looks like this. And you have a few properties there. Uh, we have name and short name. In, I think, 90% of the cases, it will use short name. The only two occasions when I've seen the long name or the regular name used is when you get that pop-up to ask the user if you want to add a shortcut to your home screen. There I've seen the, the name. And at least Chrome, I'm not sure but for other browser on mobile, it generates a splash screen from this name, the background color, and the, the icon. And on that splash screen, it uses the name. So it, that, those are the only places when I've seen. You have a team color, and it's, um, I think, only the toolbar. It colors the toolbar by whatever color you, you choose there. The background color, like I said, beside the splash screen in Chrome, I haven't seen it used anywhere else. I've tried to put it like pink or something just to notice it. But it wasn't anywhere else. It has a display property, which is uh, Quite important. I think it's um, three ways. It's standalone, like a native application. You can uh, make it look like the browser with the URL and everything. And the last one was native. I'm not sure what's the difference between standalone and, and native. I can look it up. You have the scope and start URL. Start URL is simply the page of your application. It tells it go to this thing when you start up. And the scope is where on your website is the web, um, the progressive web app. From what I understood, I never used this one. It's like you can have a really complex website, but only when you go to slash app, it's the progressive web app. And everything else, it's a regular website. And then you have to use this one to, to configure it like that. And you have the icons in different uh, sizes. Here I've just put only two of them, so they, they fit on the screen. And this is what you have to change because by default you'll get those, like I said, the angular icon and you want to put something according to your project. The second thing is this soft service worker config and it has an entry for index, which is index.html, according to there are people that don't use index.html as their main page. So they have to add this there and they have two, two things there, asset groups and, uh, and data groups. Asset groups are groups of files, and you can specify how they will be treated by the service worker. They must have a unique name, like in this case, like it's the app. They have the two modes, uh, prefetch or lazy. What this means is prefetch, just fetch them all when a new version is available. So you have a group, in this case, HTML, all the CSS, all the JS files, and the favicon. When the service worker detects that a new version is available, it will fetch all these files. If you use uh, install mode lazy, what means is that it won't prefetch anything, it will just wait for your application to request it and then it will cache it. So if you have some CSS added with lazy, when a new version is available, it won't do anything to those CSS files. It will just wait for the application to request it. First time it downloads it, it will wait, wait for it to, to download and then cache it. These files are cached like forever until a new version is available. You will always have them have them locally. And in the files, it's resource part, it's a files array. And you can specify uh, all the files that it want to cache. And of course, it accepts a limited version of Chrome. So we can just tell all the CSS and all the GS files. And you can also specify an update mode. So maybe I want, when I install the app, I don't want it to uh, fetch everything. I just want to lazy load the files. So only when I request them, but when an update is available, I want it to prefetch everything. This is the default what, generate, what Angular generates. I'm not sure why I would want to do that. But this is the default anyhow. For me, it doesn't make any sense when I install it lazy, when I make an update, get everything. I don't know, but you, can, like you can do this. For files? Yeah. Maybe, Maybe I have. For, for, example, for example, I don't know, I'm thinking like, usually what I typically ask is like language files, right? And like, if someone doesn't use a language for the application, why not? But if yeah, there's, a new, not, there's a new string update for like a specific language that he's been using, yeah, you should get it fast. I'm sure there are use cases because they've yeah. added it, but they wouldn't have added it without any valid use cases. Beside these files, 
with property in the resources, we can always also have URLs. And you can specify there like fonts. If you have uh, some fonts that we load from a content delivery network, we can just specify them there and they will be also cached locally. So you can have files and, and URLs. And the second thing you can have here is data groups. And this is especially uh, interesting when we want to cache data that we read from an API. It, again, it has the name, it has to be unique in its group. And we have an array of URLs relative to our application uh, server. And in this case, I've specified API and suppliers. This means that requests made to, to these endpoints will be cached. And we can, we can uh, specify how this cache works, like any other caching mechanism that you, you probably used. Strategy is uh, performance or freshness. What means performance? It means that it reads it once and then it uses from cache until it expires. When it expires, it's a maximum age. You can say three days or three hours or whatever, whatever time span you want. And the maximum size is the number of entities it wants it should keep. So it has 50 entities. When it grows over them, so it will start to kick them out. Beside performance, we also have freshness. And then we can also have a property timeout. And when we use freshness, we tell the service worker that it should go to the network first, but only for the time that we specify in the timeout. So go to the network, but for like half a second. If in half a second you don't have a response for the server, use the cache rush. I don't care. I want to show something to the user fast. So if the server doesn't respond in that time, just show me whatever information we have, even if that might be stale. And is the request discarded or it goes on? I have no clue. I just, just checked that I get all the information. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I mean, the next time you do Maybe the, the next time when you request it, you'll get the new information. But like for what you request now, you'll have whatever you had in the cache. How many, sorry, go ahead. Now, uh, if you refresh manually, does this thing get thrown away? It's a cache. From what I know, no, it's a cache. So unless okay. it's so expired or something, is still there. If you write there, the user has no way of clearing that manually. Uh, yeah, it's kind of tricky working with service worker in development. That's what I said. You don't want this to work in your development server because you'll end up with some weird things there. But you can manually clear the cache, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you go yeah, to dev tools and just delete yeah. everything. But, but it's it's not something like I was thinking like, like from a user's user point of view. Yeah. I'm like, thinking like if you have things like the guy calls you, hey, I, I keep cleaning refresh and I get shit back. <laughs> 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 You're like, uh, okay. No, you just click a button that calls the supplier the guy. Like, like 101 times, right? While, while the network is down, and it's like, oh, <laughs> the cache is gone. You can tell him, sorry, I added two extra zeros and it expires in 300 days. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just wait for that or something. Uh, I haven't used this yet. I've used this is part with uh, caching files. With APIs, it's quite interesting. And even with the, the files one, because imagine you, you use some kind of uh, hosting service where you store image files or something and you can uh, cache those files. So I've read, I want to look, I don't know, restaurant man. I fetch the images and then I keep them on my mobile device. I don't discard them anymore. You'll have some problems with this depending on the image size because most browsers only allow you to store up to a number of megabytes or 100, I don't know the exact, the exact value, but you have some limitations on that. But I don't think you want to cache like five gigabytes on the user's phone. It, just can't, right? it won't be very pleased by that. And this I didn't know for a while. You also have some diagnostics that you can look at on your website in production and it's enabled by default. So once you deploy a service worker, you can go to your app slash ngsw slash state and you get something that looks like this. And the most relevant part here is this debug log where it will show errors. So if you have any kind of errors with your service worker, they will be logged here and you will see, you will see them. It shows some other information. I'm not sure which of it would be relevant. The driver state is like the service worker state, which says that it's uh, normal or safe mode or 
different kind of, uh, of values. Last update check in this kind of this uh, sample, it was never. This is when it last checked for a new version, like when the last time was the page refreshes, refreshed or something like that. And the client IDs, like if you have the application open in three tabs, you'll get three clients there because there are three so different tabs. It's just one single service worker. Yeah, so it's one service, service worker, but you'll have three different tabs and you have all the clients there. So, so you can think it will be on multi tab apps. Sort of, yeah, not in yeah. Angular, but at least not now. But you will be able to, to do it with some other things. So what are the alternatives? This is what you get in Angular by default. But if you don't want this or want something more complex, you'll have to do it in some other way. If you look at the documentation or Andre or some other people that you guys did this before, you've noticed not that uh, easy or straightforward to register a service worker to send all the messages and do all this kind manually. So the guys from the Angular team built this, but they didn't make it very extensive. I wanted at some point some extra things. There's no way to add that. They are working, or they said they are working on a plugin system so you can change what the service worker does, but at, at this point, it's this is it. The caching, those two services, and there's nothing else you can do. But for me, it's, it's still great because you've seen, you can add this in like one hour and configure it in your application will be a progressive web app, and that's it. An alternative is to code everything yourself. If you want to go for that, go. I'm not recommending it. I would look at Workbox. It's a nice library project that you could use to, to create uh, progressive web apps and to handle these things with service workers. There are a few others, but I haven't seen them used in Angular context. So either they use what has, what's in Angular, they used Workbox, or they did it themselves. That's what I've seen so far, and to the people that I've asked, that's the way they did it. As a bonus and sort of a recommendation from me, we have Firebase, probably some of you have heard of it, and in Firebase we have Firestore, it's their newest NoSQL cloud database that's used to store and synchronize data. And what at least I did, and I think most of us do think of this as a real-time database. I've been with Claudio to Hacktm, and we've created a sample, a simple application that was using Firebase, and people were impressed that I was changing something on my mobile, and the data was changed on the PC screen. Wow, like five lines of code. So it's not big, that big a thing. But what we have with Firestore is offline support. This is built and enabled already for iOS and Android SDK, but you can enable it for the web. I think it's just a method called enable persistence or something like that. And you will have offline support. And what that means is that you have automatic sync. It will cache by itself some data that the application uses, and most importantly, you can make changes to the data. And when the application is back online, it will synchronize with what you have in your, in your cloud database by itself. So you won't have to specify this. Of course, it has some, uh, some settings specified there. So what happens if I change the same data that Andre changes on his phone? So there are some, some things on how that is handled, but it works out of the box. And for simple things, it's, it's great. If you're interested in more about this, it's this link is the documentation and it tells you how to use it in progressive web apps. One big downside of this is that it doesn't work for multiple tabs. So if you have the application open in three tabs, it won't kind of work. You have to use it in one tab only. I'm not sure how you'd restrict the user from doing that. <laughs> Let's say that this is, a, this is a limitation. I find this very powerful and very easy to use, but I haven't used it in production or like real world application. I've just played with it, see how it works, and, and it's quite nice. Resources, of course, Google developers have a lot of information about this, Mozilla Developer Network and the Angular Docs. If you only look at those three, it will take you at least one week to read everything that's there. That's, that's uh, more than, than enough. Um, that was it about progressive web apps. Um, some shameless plugs. I've been here before and I've presented about NGRX tips and tricks. I have a blog post written about that. If you want to hear more or almost the same things but speak on, I've been to a podcast called Adventures in Angular and I've spoken there with Charles Maxwood and John Papa about ideas and what I did in that article. 
I have a newer one about creating a toast service with Angular CDK, which we're actually using in our application in production right now. And of course, uh, I hope most of you that work with Angular know about this, but I strongly recommend you check out angularindepth.com for any advanced content. There's a really awesome group of guys there. I learn a lot from them. My latest posts are always published on that blog. And there are guys from Google Firebase and so on. So they have a, a lot of people there. They are quite good in what they do. Do you have any other questions that I might be able to answer? Uh, yeah. You said that you get the like, Firebase as the file store stuff with sync. Yeah. How do you sync data without it? So if you don't have Firebase, how do you like have to like, sync? Or do you have to do something special to get it? Your data, local data to sync to the server stuff. You mean when it's offline or generally? Yeah, but after data. it comes off from the offline. Right? So let's say like the application has been offline for a while. And you will have to do all that. I've seen some small libraries trying to do this and some people implementing themselves. So they simply cache in memory or in local storage what the user does and then they make requests to their API to, for example, if you don't use. Firebase, so you don't use the database, and you click a button to create a new user, and you're offline. It will create the user, it will store it locally, and then when the application goes online, it will call the create user API method and pause the user and then handle the case when it fails. So it's more like manual work. You can easily do it with your own application, but it's simply more work than, than we have out of the box with, with Firebase. And at least for like, hack on projects or really simple, Firebase is, is great. Would that kind of, maybe this is more of a file store question then. Uh, yeah. You have like, like the real database, you do stuff which are related, you know, you wanna, and you have like a conflict, does you know how to roll back everything which you did there? There are some, some settings you can change there, about how to resolve this kind of conflicts, <laughs> but I, I have no idea in detail what, what it tries to do. I think they try to fix them in the most easy way possible. So at least when there are conflicting changes, like we both change the same things, it just keeps the one that it changed first and that's it. It ditches everything else. And hopefully it tells you that it ditched your change, so you know to do something about that. Another thing, maybe, so what, what happened? I worked on a project for a short period of time. It had a service worker on it, but I didn't know. And we kept pushing updates. Mm, that's quite fun. And we, we had to fix stuff. There's some text which is wrong on our page. Sure, I'm just gonna change it, push it. Like, bro, the text is still wrong. What the fuck did you do? And we refresh. Ah, oh, okay, now it's there. And that keep kept happening all the time. And then like maybe it had this thing. How do you how did you handle on your project if you have some on it? This thing like uh, cache stuff, do stuff. But when I push the new version, destroy everything and take the new thing. Well. Uh... Or you didn't do it. It's a very really straight, it's a really straightforward approach from my point of view. We've used that Angular service that listen for new changes. Whenever a new version is deployed, you tell the user a new version is available, click here to refresh. And Angular by itself will create a new hash whenever you create a new build. Mm -hmm. So whatever you change, it will treat it as a new version. So it has you, you use that uh, notification thing. Yep. Okay. I don't think anyone, any but real user actually used it so far, but... <laughs> did you always use it in incognito or with the, like, uh, persistent state of the browser? Because uh, we used to develop the app and we changed stuff and then, like, check back in five minutes and nothing happened. But someone who hasn't checked it for an hour or so got it immediately and the other person had to, like, wait for another hour or two or while testing I use incognito mostly so. and like I said the, the production application that I'm working with uh, Claudio it's uh, in pilot mode so we have like three pilots I'm guessing they haven't noticed the dialogue or it mm -hmm. might not work I don't know <laughs> at least in development it worked and I deployed it to production too. I don't know the one I used was in react so I don't know if it had all those it has all those fancy stuff uh, I think like even like this, the VS Web Apps, it still yeah. uses the uh, service worker workbox from Google. 
Yeah, I think behind the scene it, so it's it, still, it still the same library, so like the, the service worker should be the same. I think it just hides everything, and you get like and I something very easy. The progressive web apps part is just the integration into Angular. So yeah. Behind this, we use the same like service worker library. Because I, I've seen the same thing like the manifest file is the same for everything. So that part is generic. The asset groups and everything. It's like whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not use, generic. It's, it's a separate the library. It's a separate library that we can actually use independently. So that actually that's. I've seen that at least I've seen that you can just do it by hand, by hand just adding that library to your whatever app. Okay. Uh, there's a guy from Oslo, I think. It's called Maxim something. I don't want to mess up his name. You can look up for him. He was at uh, Angular Connect recently. And he has a presentation when he shows how to do this with uh, the service worker from Angular and with Workbox. So you can see a comparison between those two and and what they do. What I've heard from a lot of people is that, okay, service workers are cool, are nice. What Angular did is very nice because we can easily add the support, but we cannot do whatever we want with it because we cannot extend it, we cannot change it, so it's too basic for, for our needs. But if you want to use it in a like, more simple application and not that fancy things, it's... In the end, you can just write around the service worker. It's fine. I'm not sure what you're going to do when you already have a service worker registered with what you have in Angular, and then you roll out your own. And I can then you, handle you push a version <laughs> where you unregister the service worker, and then uh, force a reload after the service worker is unregistered, and then you push another version of it. With a new service worker. I never got to the second part, but I did the first <laughs> <laughs> Very important Another to refresh the user's page after you unregister the service worker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Another question: uh, Have you used the uh, index DB? No. Uh, I've read a bit about it, but I've never used it. Not even like playing with it. So. Are you interested in uh, how it works with uh, yes. service worker and yes, and cache stuff? Cache, cache index DB is uh, uh, improved, and uh, the store is uh, uh, persistent out there. Yes, but uh, the difference is that in IndexedDB you can only store data, yes. right? Like it's, so it's like a database. Like yes, the so that, 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 that database in the browser. Yes, exactly. Yes. Service workers are better integrated. That's a thing, but the cache it can store in index that way. Yeah, the data. But not the, the files. Data. Yeah, not yeah, the yeah. files. Yeah. Sure, of course. So you can do that. Uh, I'm also curious. Like, do you do you know how the push notifications work for uh, with the PWAs? I mean, if you have a PWA installed, and let's say you go, uh, you you close the app, like yeah. to to clear or you start your call, right? Yeah. And you are not online, for instance. Do the service worker is it registered as a background? Uh, service on the native side, so when you don't have an uh, internet connection uh, and somebody yeah. pushes as far as I know, yeah. you go online, you get the uh, notification banner from, from what the, I've seen, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. It, too, it works on the same principle as like, there's a, like, right, the new WebRC stuff for the notifications yeah. that you get on the browser. So for example, now you, a lot of browsers, a lot of pages get to that, like, oh, do you like to receive notification from yeah, and yeah, so they, yeah, yeah, that thing also generates, like, at least on Windows, generates native notifications. If you have any mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, of course. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you just get, like, in browser stuff, but if you're, like, in HTTPS, you get native ones. And it's basically, like, a, an API that the browser exposes them and it connects with the underlying OS. So basically, you have a browser API to push native notifications. Uh, and oh, the okay. service worker, it's basically it has a different lifecycle than a wrap. It just remains somewhere. Again, I haven't tested this in production, but mm -hmm. from what I've played with it, it's like I said, it's a service, like a service that runs in the background and it will listen for, for notifications. And you have time. to, uh, it prompts you to enable. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. Of course. You'll get like exactly the same prompt. Oh, okay. We want to enable notifications because mm -hmm. otherwise, yeah. no. That's, uh, that's actually, I think, the moment where it registers this as a service that runs in the background and listens for them. So you have to specify somewhere that you want to ask permissions for that. In uh, Angular case, is that service, and when you subscribe to notifications, it will ask the user if he wants to, if he wants to receive notification. And hits no, then 
sad puppy face will not be able to see any kind of notifications. But do you know if you can receive both uh, push notifications uh, in the native ones and in the browser? Uh, I, I, do one I think it basically kind of did like the same thing. Like if an app gets an, an app ID, like kind of as you would on a native application, right? you just get a, like a device. ID, it's the same, the same approach. Yeah, you get the ID. Yeah. But you basically need like a, a server that knows to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Or you have the same stuff. implementation as with native apps. I, I don't know exactly how it works on, on the server side. I mean, like which provider you use to push notifications to Chrome. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Firebase Cloud Messaging. That's yeah, what so I've tried to test yeah, this out. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's basically something like the same, same thing like that. Like the Google one, the native one, and the iOS one is just this one, just for Firebase. Yeah, so it's basically like the, when you try to make native, uh, native apps and you want to push notifications, you basically have to use like, the, like iPhone's push notification service. Yeah, so it, like Chrome has the Firebase. So but this I, like some backend infrastructure provided by Chrome that you can use to push notifications to Chrome. You can't just like do it. You didn't really like wake up a phone and go over the internet. Yeah, not like yeah. How? Because because it's like, built in uh, in a browser. Yeah. Push notification API. Yes. Yeah, but so your browser push, has. Yeah, push a web notification, not a yeah, not a mobile notification. No, it's, no, it's, it's, it's a mobile. It's yeah. It's, it's like a mobile notification, but it's a different provider. It's basically like a different it's web. Yeah, it's a different service that's pushing. But yeah. the end result for the guy is it gonna look the same on his phone? Like yeah. for yeah. the other notification? Okay. Yeah, if you're a user, you won't be able to tell any kind of difference yeah. between them. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't look the same, yeah. but the, the web API, not the mobile API. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that, that was essential because they also work on iPhones now. Uh, mm -hmm. Two years ago, no one would look at progressive web apps because there was no support on Safari for iOS for them. But now they work, and now they are gaining a lot of traction. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. It's and, really and do you get the install banner on, on Safari also? Like, does I, it prompt you? Do you want to? I didn't. I didn't get screen? it. I tried it. And I didn't. You didn't? No, it is no, not for me. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any iPhone. Yeah, they don't support. No, no. <laughs> you have to click uh, manually. Three dots. Manually. And then add. Mm. Add three dots. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, how uh, you can you talk about uh, Angular on the desktop? Uh, what do you use on that? Well, because the, the browser has uh, experimental uh, way to add icon on the desktop. Uh, I've tried it in development mode. So if you go to yes. Chrome to the dev tools, you can add a shortcut to your desktop. Yes. And it. It launches the application, and I couldn't tell, for example, which is a progressive web app and which is something that works with Electron behind the scenes. Like, I, on my right monitor, I had Slack. On the left, I had the basic application that I, I enabled this progressive web thing for it. I had an icon for both. They were starting in the same window, same shell. There wasn't much of a difference between them. So you use uh, Electron? No, no, no. I, it's a Chromeless browser. It's just yeah. a browser yeah. with no. Chrome. It starts a new Chrome instance in its own window, own tab, and it loads your application. Yeah, yeah, I know it, that it's experimental. It's not uh, standard to add an uh, icon on a desktop. Uh, it probably at browser level because browser level, yeah. Yeah, but in Chrome maybe. Yeah. I've only tried it with. Uh, I've known that Edge added something, but I didn't work on it. I guess the one, for example, in the Microsoft Store. They will work with Edge, I assume. They, they, are started, they start a new Edge instance behind the scene. And those, I've tried a few just to see how they work. You can find them in the App Store, click install, you will get a shortcut and it starts Edge. Yeah, but if you want to publish them in the App Store, you have to go through the same process. You have to publish them yeah. in the App Store. Yeah, yeah. it's not necessarily nice. <laughs> yeah, but. So I'm not sure, I've only tried it with latest version of Chrome. I hope it wasn't Canary and I had to manually go and there's a link in the DevTools add shortcut to home screen. And it had the shortcut to home screen, same thing worked. It had the icon of our application. I've had this with the, with the project that I'm working with. And this is nice. I don't know, maybe you want to do it like that for some users, especially if I have, I don't know, some financial software or something like that. No, because I have to make an app for some that's going to be used in Kenya. And 
Yeah, the internet is going to be bad. Yeah. The wind has been broken by Okay, thanks. I thought it was going to be a short presentation, but it was almost an hour, so sorry about that. <laughs>